So let's talk about meta. And <clears throat> a lot of, and let me start with this, is that I kind of got confused on the golden rule. You know, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And for some reason I was thinking, do unto others as you would do unto yourself. But that would never work because I'd be running around screaming at people, telling them that they weren't good enough and that everybody was going to figure out at some point that they were an imposter and that they don't deserve to be happy. Um, anybody else ever have that voice in your head that's a little bit critical towards yourself? Yeah. So why don't we talk about that tonight? Because it seems like it's something that everybody has, but nobody really ever talks about. We always assume everybody else is happy with themselves. Everybody else loves themselves and cares for themselves and does. And we have some evidence for it because there's a lot of selfish, greedy people out there. And yet, if you ask somebody, most people will say, yeah, I kind of am hard on myself sometimes. Um, overly critical. So meta is um, <clears throat> a Pali term. Pali is the language that the Buddha more or less spoke back 25, 2600 years ago. And it is variously translated, uh, but it comes from a word that basically means friend or friendly, mitta. And it is one of four uh, of a category of things that are called Brahma Viharas. Again, a Pali term, and I'm sorry for throwing a bunch of foreign language at you right away. But Brahma Vihara is kind of like, um, it's, it, the literal translation is noble abodes or heavenly homes or really kick-ass property, you know, some place that you can go to where you feel safe and that is furnished nicely. Some place that's comfortable. And there's four of these, like I said, Brahma Viharas. The first one is Metta, the very foundational one. And then we have Karuna, which means compassion. Mudita, which is finding joy in others like other people's success or just basically leeching off of other people's joy. And then upeka or equanimity, that kind of ease and balance, you know, the feeling that we have all too rarely. And metta or this friendliness, this caring, you can even translate it as a kind of love, love for others, love for ourselves. Um, is kind of the foundation for these other three in a lot of ways. In other words, you can think of compassion as friendly love, caring, that meets somebody in pain. I care for someone, I see them suffering, compassion arises. It's just the expression of metta in that context. Likewise, when we have care for others and we see them succeed, we see them kicking ass, we see them getting what they need and what they want, we naturally feel joy for them. And so this you know, empathetic joy arises naturally. And when we have this natural care for all the world in a very broad way, where we can see the world as it is and accept it and bring joy and care to it, that naturally brings equanimity, that balance. That all makes sense? But meta is very much a foundation for these, although you can kind of flip it if you want and think of equanimity as if you've got equanimity, then this kind of care and love naturally arises as well for the world in an interesting way. So last week I talked about metta as well. 
um, but kind of addressed it in a different way. I talked about metta and emptiness. That is that metta is not something that's additional. Metta is not something that we go out and earn or work for. Metta is something that naturally arises, believe it or not, if we just get out of the way. Now, if you're like me, that may be hard to believe because we're self-critical. And I want to tell myself, no, you're not that, you know, you don't have that kind of mindset. You're not that naturally kind and caring. But believe it or not, if we can stop the voices in our head, if we can stop the critiques, if we can just be present and get out of the way, care and friendliness can naturally arise. And it's not just me. Others have done this practice for thousands of years and they found the same thing. And the fact that they found this thing, same thing true is what I talked about last week as the Dhamma, the teachings, this Buddhist thing we're doing is what's called lawful. And by lawful, I don't mean that it's not breaking the law. I don't mean that it you know, doesn't jaywalk. What I mean is more like lawful in the sense of like a scientific theory, like the law of gravity, right? It always works. If I hold this up and I let this go, I know it's going to fall. That's the law, right? Um, and we may want to break the law, but we can't. Likewise, if we do these practices of the Brahma Viharas, and particularly if we do the practice of metta, we will be transformed. And I say this as a former doubter who was drug into doing metta. I went on a nine-day silent retreat doing nothing but metta. And for about five or six days, I swore, this is boring, this is stupid, it's not going to work, I'm the exception. I'm the one guy who's so broken that this is not going to happen. And then about day six or seven, I'm minding my own business, meditating in the meditation hall, and I find myself weeping uncontrollably. So this stuff does work, even for old assholes like me. Um, so there is that you can trust that, you know, for thousands of years, people have tried this, they've refined it, and it works. One other bit of background is that that will be useful for later on, is that there are two enemies of metta. There's the distant enemy and the near enemy. And the distant enemy is cruelty or hatred. And that's the distant enemy. And the near enemy is care or um, affection, but with attachments. Like, I care for you because I love you if. I love you, just don't fuck it up. That sort of love or care with conditions. So Metta is much more unconditional. All good? So the Buddha came up with this 2,500 years before anybody said unconditional love, I think. So he, he was ahead of the curve. All right, and now to give you a little bit more feel for it, I'm going to read what's called the Metta Sutta, or a, a, one of the teachings of the Buddha specifically about Metta. I'm reading a translation because, uh, out of this book because it's a good excuse to show you the book, Boundless Heart by Christina Feldman. Great book if you want to explore the Brahma Viharas further. Um, that sounded really teacherly. I'm usually, I try not to be that uptight, but uh, anyway, the Metta Sutta. To reach the state of peace, one skilled in the good should be capable and upright, easy to speak to and straightforward, of gentle nature and not proud, contented and easily supported, living lightly and having few duties, wise and with senses calmed, not arrogant and without greed for supporters, and should not do the least thing that the wise would reproach them for. <clears throat> One should reflect in this way. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings be happy-minded. 
Whatever living beings there may, may be, whether weak or strong, tall, large, medium or short, small or big, seen or unseen, near or distant, born or to be born, may they without exception all be happy-minded. Let no one despise another or deceive anyone anywhere. Let no one through anger or hatred wish for another suffering. As a mother would risk her own life to protect her child, her only child, so for all beings one should guard one's boundless heart. With boundless friendliness for the whole world should one cultivate a boundless heart. In all directions, without obstruction, without hate and without ill will, standing or walking, sitting or lying down, whenever one is awake, may one stay with this recollection. This is called the best and most sublime way of dwelling in this world. One who is virtuous, endowed with insight, not clinging to wrong views, and having overcome all passion for sensual pleasure, will not come to lie in a womb again. In other words, the Buddha is saying, if you do this, you do it all day whenever you're awake, you will end the suffering, the constant return of life after life, this, what's called samsara, the cycle of suffering. It's a pretty big promise. Now, as I mentioned, it comes from the word friend, which I really like because I'm not naturally an ooey gooey type no matter how many times I may start crying without meaning to in the middle of meditating, but no, I'm, uh, you know, uh, that's not my natural being. Um, and for me to think about loving the world, loving those that maybe I'm not in a great relationship, that can be a lot to bite off in one chew. But friendliness, friendliness I can kind of okay, be okay with, right? We can all be a little bit friendly. Um, and there's a sense that we've all had the experience of having to be friendly with someone that maybe we didn't even like that much, right? And it doesn't have to rise to the level of lying to them. You don't have to overdo it. You don't have to say, you know, you're my best buddy ever. I'd take a bullet for you if you don't feel it. But you can smile, greet them warmly, ask them how they're doing, act like you care. Be friendly. It's a starting point. It's a first step. Okay? So I would take this meta stuff and I would feel like, okay, I'm supposed to feel this here. I'm supposed to feel meta. I don't feel meta, right? Something is wrong with me. Oh no, okay, maybe I can start with just being friendly. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fake it for a minute. I'm gonna fake friendliness for myself, for others. Just start there. And this wishing ourselves and others well when we don't feel it, 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 you know, it, it may be like, hey, Roy, what the hell are you talking about? This is all so fake. But there is the old, you know, fake it till you make it. And that's okay here. We're not saying anything untrue. We're not misleading. We are acting in a way that's reflecting how we want to be, how we will be, even if we aren't emotionally fully bought in yet. So we're acting in a way that's appropriate, hopefully, to the situation, because open animosity often doesn't work. Right? And we can act skillfully regardless of our mental state. There's this story we tell ourselves that somehow my mental state is what counts and my actions just have to follow the mental state. But my experience is that that's actually pretty misguided. If I'm always acting based on my mental state, then I'm gonna do a lot of things that 
aren't great. You know, if I'm grumpy, I'm just going to start yelling at everybody. And if somebody questions me, well, that's my mental state. Sorry, I'm just feeling grumpy. Screw you, right? And we're not taking responsibility for addressing our own mental states or our actions. So if we can act friendly, even when we're grumpy, it's a first step towards not being, not taking when we feel greedy. It's a first step towards maybe not abusing substances or sex or, you know, love or anything else when we feel like doing those things. There's a maturity in being able to say, I have this feeling, I have this thought, but that is not my prison. I'm not subject to that. I am not a slave to that. I can still act appropriately and usefully even with those mental states or emotional states. Does that make sense? Have I convinced you? Okay. Um, we can guard our thoughts and our speech and our actions no matter what. So this is an important point, I think, is that metta is not a state of mind. You can practice metta and be as pissed off as you want to be. It's still possible. Trust me, I've done it. I have been pissed off as hell and still practiced metta. In fact, I mentioned last week, a lot of times what comes up with metta practice is it's what's called a purification practice or all the opposites of these things pop up. So when we try and act with metta, what comes up? The far enemy, cruelty and hatred. You know? So all of a sudden, I'm trying to feel loving kindness, maybe, and we'll talk about the different folks that we'll feel loving kindness for, but maybe for what's called a benefactor. So somebody that's always treated me well, that fifth grade teacher who saw something in me that nobody else did, that puppy that I just got who's so sweet even though she pees all over the rug and that I love so much. And you're wishing metta for this benefactor and all of these feelings of animosity start coming up, maybe even for the benefactor. That's okay. That's okay. Just keep going. I'm feeling these things. I acknowledge them. I see them. And I'm still wishing well. There's, um, the Buddha said something that I think relates to this. He said, looking after oneself, one looks after others. Looking after others, one looks after oneself. How does one look after others whilst looking after oneself? By practicing mindfulness, developing it and making it grow. How does one look after oneself by looking after others? By patience, non-harming, friendliness and caring. In other words, saying a big part of this practice is what's called mindfulness, is that we simply are aware of what's arising without judgment. I'm having animosity arise. Okay, I'm having animosity arise. It doesn't make me a bad person. It doesn't mean I'm broken. It doesn't mean I'm not doing it right. It just means that there's animosity. I accept that and I continue to do the practice. But we have to have patience. We have to allow ourselves to feel things that we don't want to feel, to have thoughts that we don't want to have. As long as we return to non-harming, we return to friendliness, we return to caring, we return over and over to these things and don't worry about what the mind happens to be doing in that moment. So it's not just wishing well for others, but it's an attitude of acceptance, gratitude, and kindness towards ourselves, towards others, and towards this moment. Can we feel gratitude and kindness towards this moment? This moment, Roy said something that pissed me off. Okay, I can still be grateful I'm here. I can be kind. I can be thoughtful. 
And so we act with metta even if we aren't feeling it. And that means we aren't acting with cruelty. It means we aren't acting with violence. The enemy of this is again cruelty. And when we act without metta, it's by definition cruel, even when it's towards ourselves. When I say I'm not good enough, that's an act of violence towards myself. When I say you can't do this, that's an act of cruelty towards myself. It's not nice. We wouldn't say that to just the average person that we meet day to day, and yet we say these awful things to ourselves, or at least I say these awful things to myself, and it is violent. So we feel these things, we have these thoughts, but then we return to, I'm going to be kind to myself. I hear the thought, I'm going to let it go and not pursue it. Because we're never going to be able to hate ourselves into awakening. We're never going to hate ourselves into being better people. I've tried it for many years. It never worked. Well, you're such an idiot. No, that did not make me any smarter, and it didn't make me any more kind, and it did not progress my practice one iota. So I return to, Roy, I love you, keep going. I return to Roy, may you be happy. I return to a friendly voice of, you know, hey Roy, hang in there, you're doing great. Can I turn that mind to a place where it's speaking to me as a friend rather than that judgmental jerk? It seems really simple, doesn't it? But it's a lot of years of conditioning, and so we have to repeat it over and over and over again. That's why I say this stuff is lawful, even though it may not impact you the first day, the first week, the first month, maybe not even the first year. If you keep at it, it eventually will wear down those old voices and start replacing them with new, friendlier voices. Hi, friend. What would you like to do today? Good job, friend. Oh, that was tough. Yeah, you could have done a little better, but you did the best you could, and you learned a ton. That was good information. These are all great things that we can say to ourselves. And then that near enemy of I love you if. This can take the form of, I love myself because. How often do we love ourselves because of, rather than simply loving ourselves? I want to tell a story that I have very mixed feelings about, but I'm just going to tell it because I think it's illustrative. So I was at uh, the coffee shop, and I saw a, a young woman, tween, I'd say, you know, 10 to 12-ish age, uh, and she was wearing a t-shirt that said, I heart myself. And she had a tutu on and was just having a nice time hanging out with her friends. And of course, me being conditioned how I've been, I immediately wanted to find something wrong with the t-shirt. Like, you know, I went the Buddhist, you know, philosophical route, well, there is no self. <laughs> yeah, she needs to learn anatta. She's going to wake up one day and realize there's no self, you know, right? It's like, Roy, chill. You know, take a, you know, take another sip of coffee, relax, it'll be okay. Um, and I think that there is truth and we should heart ourselves. There's also different stages of hearting ourselves. You know, the 13-year-old when I was 13 year old, a 13 year old, if I hearted myself, it was because, oh, I love how quirky I am, or I love that I'm different than everybody else, or I love that I'm you know, smart or good looking or whatever it is that I would feel that day. And then the next day I would say, oh, I hate myself because I'm not smart and I'm not good looking and I'm not this and I'm not that, right? 
So it's very conditioned on what we are. And the reality that the Buddha points us to over and over again is that whatever you are, whatever you rely on, it will eventually fall apart. If you love yourself because you're smart, your brain will one day get old and tired and start falling apart if you're lucky enough to not get hit by a bus, right? If you're lucky enough to live long enough, the brain will not be as sharp as it once was. If it's because of your beauty, your beauty by, you know, cultural standards will fade. Your body will fall apart. Your mind will fall apart. Your friends will be far away. The people you don't want to be around will be right next to you. There are things that will not be great. We can't rely on any of that. So if it's I heart myself because, that's never going to work. Now, if you are a 75-year-old marginalized person and you've been told your whole life that you're not as good as, and you're wearing a t-shirt that says, I heart myself, I am there for it, I will give you high fives all day long, you have earned that. Because that person probably really gets that they love themselves not because of some aspect, but simply they love themselves unconditionally. And as I'm saying that, it's striking me again how hard that is. How hard it is to actually just love ourselves regardless. Oh, I fucked up that up project. I love myself. I should have been kinder to my spouse, my loved one, my child. I accidentally stepped on the dog's paw. I love myself. I still love myself. Meta gets to the root of our relationships with ourselves and with others. And much of how we relate to others and even of ourselves, but mostly, you know, I, I want to talk more about others right now, is we project those stories that we tell ourselves or our way of seeing the world onto others. So, if I would deal with a situation in a particular way, I assume everyone else will. Or if I would be thinking something in a situation, I think everybody else would. Um, and we want to make people fixed and permanent and unchanging, just like we want to make ourselves fixed and permanent and unchanging. I'm smart and I'm always going to be smart. I'm stupid and I'm always going to be stupid. That person needs to dress better and they're always going to need to dress better. You know, that person is never going to be good at their jobs or they're always going to be good at their jobs. And we project feelings onto others. I'm upset. We assume everybody else is upset. I'm cynical. I assume everybody else is cynical. And it's related not just to a psychological projection, but that wanting to fix and make people locked in stone and unchanging. We have this conceit, it's called. And when, the, when Buddhism and the Buddha spoke of conceit, it wasn't, I'm so good, pat myself on the back. The way the Buddha used the term is, he actually, he literally said, to think yourself better than others is, a, is conceit. To think yourself worse than others is conceit. To lock people in as a certain thing is a conceit. So when he, he uses the word conceit, it's an older um, meaning for the English term conceit, which is something that we make up. Like you'll see it in stories, novels, movies. Like the conceit that we think we're all conscious, but really we're just in this big room in vats, having our energy sucked out of us and having thoughts projected into our brain like in the matrix. That was the conceit 
of the matrix. If I tell you a story about my dog driving, the conceit of the story is that my dog drives my car, right? It's a conceit, it isn't real. And we make up these conceits about ourselves and others. And the conceit is that there's something wrong with me, or there's something wrong with others, or I feel this way and I will always feel this way or that we're fixed and never going to really change. When there is so much evidence all around us every second that we are not fixed, that everything is constantly changing. But we're taught that if we really acknowledge this change, it feels like the rug getting pulled out from under us, right? What am I going to rely on? And so it's a useful conceit. I have a conceit that my job will still be there tomorrow, and thus I drive and it's there. And lo and behold, it is there. But there will be a day when my job is not there, either because the job goes away or because I go away, right? I retire, I quit, I get hit by that bus. But one day there will not be a job there. It is not fixed and permanent. But for today, it's really useful to pretend to have a conceit that it's always going to be there. It's how we get out of bed in the morning, how we do our lives. So I'm not saying never have a conceit. What I'm saying is don't take it seriously. Notice I'm having a conceit right now. I'm having, I'm working on a theory that I know is wrong, but it works. Like that gravity, right? I have a theory based on Newton, that, or actually based on Aristotle, that this falls to the ground because it's heavy. And if it was lighter, it wouldn't fall as fast, right? Because it's not as heavy. That's our conceit. It's what we think. Newton went up to the Tower of Pisa, held two objects. One was heavy, one was light, but they were shaped the same, dropped them both, and they both fell at the same rate. Gravity has nothing to do with how heavy an object is. Einstein showed things fall because time and space bend. Time and space bend. That's what makes things fall. But if I'm playing catch with my granddaughter, I'm not thinking, okay, how fast, it, you know, how much is time and space bending? No, I think, okay, this is how heavy it is. My brain is using the conceit that gravity is based on heaviness and it works. But if I'm in an advanced applied physics course, I have to know about Einstein's theory of relativity and use that. So what I'm saying is, in our daily world, we can use the Aristotle's version of reality that this is fixed, that I can rely on this, but I really know in the back of my mind that's not true. So I don't get caught in it. So in this world, in this moment, I would argue that there's the potential for two miracles. One miracle is always there and unavoidable. That is that 13 billion years ago, some tiny subatomic particle went left versus right. That created a chain of events that eventually led to our sun, our solar system, and us being here. And the odds of us being here are so astronomically small. But we are. That's a miracle. The second miracle is in some ways more important, but it's voluntary. It's giving ourselves the opportunity to appreciate this moment as the miracle that it is. And I would argue that this is an act 
of kindness to ourselves. This is where metta meets this other mindfulness practice that we often do. Is I can say, Roy, I give you the experience of this moment. I am not going to chase after thoughts. I'm not going to continue an internal dialogue. I'm not going to act cruelly and violently towards myself or others. I'm going to stop in this moment and give myself this experience of this moment and the miracle that it is. So this entire practice of mindfulness, this entire practice uh, of insight and deep meditative states is really just an act of kindness to ourselves. And can we stop and get out of our own way and be gentle and friendly enough with ourselves to actually open up to the experience of this moment? And I would make the argument that if you are willing to be that kind to yourself over and over and over again, that is the entirety of this practice. There is nothing else you need to learn, nothing else you need to worry about. Just simply over and over again, each moment saying, I offer myself this moment as an act of kindness. And from that, gratitude arises, from that, all these other things say. Somewhere in here I have a quote from the Dalai Lama um, that I can't seem to find, which says, uh, my religion is simple. My religion is simply kindness. That's the whole of it. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and do this. And I'm, let me kind of explain what we're going to do. And that is... Um, we can start with that place of emptiness so, and, and we'll start with again breath like we did at the first meditation and just following breath and allowing some of our thoughts to get some space between them. And in that space between thoughts, we can start to feel over time metta arise on its own. So it's just a reminder that we don't have to create something. We don't have to work hard for it. And then to give that further foundation to support that, we'll say some phrases. And the phrases I'm going to start with, and you can create your own, but there are basically four types of categories we want to hit. Uh, safety, happiness, health, and ease. So we'll start with a, that benefactor. So it could be your puppy, your pet lizard, the, um, your old mentor, somebody that you care about. Now, I do suggest that it not be somebody that you have a romantic attachment to because that very easily turns into that near enemy of I love you because, right, that attachment. So in order to make this as easy, so what we want to do is find, make this as easy as we possibly can. Do not make yourself do the advanced calculus of it. Okay. Part of the kindness of this is doing the practice with whatever works. So. We start with somebody really easy to love, and then we'll work towards ourself. And that's all we're going to do tonight. Now, part of the practice also is to work with somebody that you're friends with, but maybe not that benefactor. So rather than the puppy, it's the sibling that you generally get along with, but not 100% of the time. Um, somebody that's a coworker that you like but nobody's perfect kind of person. And then uh, <clears throat> the final group for when you're really feeling it is somebody that you have uh, some sort of animosity towards or maybe just not great feelings. And again, start, you know, when you do this, if you want to do this on your own, my suggestion is do the first couple first. Get really solid in, you know, up through the friend, and then allow somebody to come to mind that is kind of that enemy-ish, but not too enemy-ish, right? The easiest hard person to care for, right? 
So kind of in one way of thinking about it is your friend is your hardest easy person to love and your enemy is going to be your easiest hard person to love. Um, and then we're going to, you know, like I said, we'll do that for your benefactor, then for ourselves. And then what you can also do is implement this if you have a regular practice, like for example, you follow your breath when you meditate or you have some physical thing that, you know, your body or sounds or whatever it is. Um, you can substitute this as that anchor. So rather than following your breath, you come back to, may I be safe? May I be happy? May I be healthy? May I be at ease? So when the mind wanders off, come back to, may I be safe? Just over and over again. And it is actually a very powerful meditative practice, just like breath or these other things. Again, you don't have to feel gooey. Good chance you won't tonight. But that's okay. It just means you're doing the work. You may even feel some animosity towards somebody. It's okay. No requirement to feel gooey. No requirement to feel anything at all. Just do the practice. Trust it. Um, so let me wrap up saying, you know, meta is friendliness, but made universal. A lot of our friendliness can be very clicky. Uh, what's tonight, Wednesday night? If you go out on Broadway tonight, and especially if you go out tomorrow night or Friday night, you will find a lot of people wearing matching t-shirts being very friendly to each other, right? But that isn't necessarily meta. If, if you, you know, run into that bachelor party or bachelorette party and you try and intrude, my experience is usually these groups have an enforcer who will come right over and get in your face and tell you, this is our group, go away. Because our friendship extends to our friends and no further. This is friendliness to the whole universe. This is asking the question, can I have a matching t-shirt with the universe? You know, maybe we have the t-shirt that says I'm with universe and it says I'm with stupid or whatever it is, you know. Can we have those matching t-shirts? Can we be friendly without limit? Can we even be friendly with parts of ourselves that annoy us, that we wish were different? Can we see how we project, how we project our own animosity towards ourselves onto others? Can we see our unkindness? Can we see how meta can undercut these projections, undercut these um, unkindnesses. Can we see metta or love as a verb and not a state of being? Right? Can we have metta without feeling it as a habit? And always metta is in this moment. There's never future mo metta there's never past metta. Metta is only now. But if we run enough nows together, it can become a habit. But it's a habit always now. It's something that sees the world as a miracle and says, yeah, I want some of that. Okay. Without judgment, with acceptance and gratitude. So anybody excited to actually do this? Can I hear a woo? Woo! -hoo. All right, all right. Well, once again, assume the position. Uh, get yourself upright, but at ease. And. 
Again, if you're comfortable with it, close your eyes or a soft gaze. And without pushing too hard, without having to scrounge around, just think, uh, allow to arise into your mind someone that you care for unconditionally. Someone that's always there for you. That doesn't approach you with expectations, but just simply accepts you for you. Perhaps they're sitting across from you or in your lap or, you know, if it's an animal or, you know, just somewhere in a warm and friendly place, perhaps with a smile, a look of acceptance. And just note any feelings that naturally arise. We can take a moment just at this point simply to notice our breath and notice any feelings that may be there or may not be there. But allowing our breath to come and go, noting inhales and out, out exhalations. But with that image in our mind, holding both at the same time. The image of a caring person or being, and simply resting in our breath, in our body. Noting any feelings that may arise without judgment, without demanding them. And if they don't arise, that's perfectly great. And holding this image in your mind, clearly picturing the being. Allow the thought to arise in your mind. May you be safe. Simply seeing how that lands. May you be safe towards this being. Allowing to arise, may you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be at ease. And repeating these phrases again, may you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be at ease. <clears throat> Repeating them at a pace that feels natural to you. And while keeping the image, or at least the idea of 
the person or being in mind. So if you find that the phrases start to lose their meaning or you start to lose the idea of the individual, coming back and repeating and coming back and raising the image of the individual and making sure that there is some meaning in the words. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be at ease. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be at ease. Simply repeating these phrases at your own pace. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be at ease. If the mind wanders off or starts to lose meaning, simply returning. Perhaps smiling internally with kindness to yourself, smilingly returning to the phrases. And gently allowing the image of that being to fade away, perhaps with a hug or a careful glance, a thoughtful expression, allowing it to fade and bringing up an image of yourself. It can be as you are now, it may be you when you were younger, 
just an image of yourself that's kind. You look rested. You look at ease. You have your most gentle and kind expression. And you're feeling good. Thoughtful. And seeing any anything uh, seeing any feelings that may arise, feeling those feelings. If it's helpful, you can put your hand on your chest, feeling into the heart space, noting any feelings of kindness that may arise or any other feelings. And feeling a connection with that image, repeating, may I be safe. Allowing that to sink in. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I live with ease. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I live with ease. Repeating those phrases. Noting any feelings of warmth or kindness, noting any resistance, simply noting without judgment. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I live with ease. We'll just repeat those phrases silently, returning to them over and over again for the last few minutes.
What's up, y'all? Reverend Mikey Noshal here from Wild Heart Meditation Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for checking us out. Do me a favor, please like and subscribe. And if you feel moved to leave a donation, you can do so at wildheartmeditationcenter.org or the Venmo link in the description. Peace and love.